wonderful and almost solemn occasion uh, to look at this anew and afresh and to invite back those who were here then, those who built this monument, those who witnessed Churchill give his speech at Westminster College in 1946. In addition to the luminaries, members of the Churchill family, dignitaries from around the world who are joining us for the 50th anniversary celebration, we have several special exhibitions. One about Christopher Wren and the relocation, the audacious move to move the Christopher Wren Church from London to Fulton. We've gone to our archives and pulled out some never before seen items uh, to trace the story of how this church came to Fulton from London. Another exhibition called Painting as a Pastime from Winston to the White House explored Churchill's own passion for painting and the inspiration that he had on other world leaders, including George W. Bush, President Eisenhower, and even John F. Kennedy. And finally, uh, we've done something remarkable. We've invited the youngest generation, the next generation, K through 12 students, 4,000, to imagine the concept of a special relationship. And they answered the call. 4,000 images, 4,000 statements uh, of what the special relationship and alliance building means. And this 50-year mark, this milestone anniversary, this golden jubilee for the National Church and Museum uh, is a perfect chance for us to uh, celebrate that. It was a grand occasion in May, and for those of you who were there with us, thank you for, for being there. Um, and I think as, as a reminder of why we do what we do every day uh, in the next two or three minutes, I'd like to tell you uh, a little bit of a reminder for some of you about our story. It all started um, in, in, in 1945, uh, after the VE Day, the great victory in Europe. Uh, when Westminster College had a bold idea to invite Winston Churchill uh, to Fulton to give a speech. Uh, I'm convinced that speech would have been given to a secretary, politely said, tell them I can't possibly come, save for perhaps the most famous postscript in history, uh, that which was uh, a pen to the bottom of the letter uh, that says, this is a wonderful school in my home state. Hope you can do it. I'll introduce you. Best regards, Harry Truman. Uh, and when Churchill saw that, uh, the first of one, uh, first of three really bold moves uh, for Westminster and, and Fulton occurred. Uh, the one was inviting Churchill to uh, give the speech in the middle of America. The second, as we saw uh, in the video and through Edwina's great remarks, was to boldly and rather audaciously move from central London to mid-Missouri a Christopher Wren church, stone by stone, 7,000 stones. It was destroyed all but destroyed, at least, in the Blitz uh, in 1940, uh, but as a symbol of Churchillian resolve and resilience, it was rebuilt stone by stone uh, in Fulton as America's National Churchill Museum. And the third major move really was to um, dedicate uh, a memorial uh, to the end of the Cold War, which we've learned so much about today, uh, by erecting uh, eight sections of the Berlin Wall in Edwina's masterpiece, Breakthrough, which was dedicated, as she said, by President Reagan uh, 29 years ago on the first anniversary of the demise of the wall. Um, since that time, world leaders uh, and luminaries have made the pilgrimage, the trek, to Westminster College to speak. Uh, President Reagan, Gorbachev, Margaret Thatcher, George H.W. Bush, to name a few, have followed in Winston Churchill's footsteps to make remarks uh, in Fulton. Uh, in the last few years, we've had others uh, follow in those same footsteps uh, to give lectures, uh, to bring their own insights on history and world affairs uh, on the Westminster College platform or the Fulton stage. Uh, but little known, I think, uh, is perhaps uh, one of our greatest assets. That's the museum's collection. We have over 10,000 objects uh, in Fulton, including uh, donations from Churchill mem uh, family members uh, and other uh, luminaries throughout the world who've shared and entrusted us with those treasures uh, for safekeeping and to inspire and inform future generations. Uh, recently, we acquired a new painting, uh, one of Winston Churchill's <coughs> paintings, uh, that is now on view uh, at the museum. Uh, we also have in our collection uh, the near final version of the Iron Curtain speech uh, that Klaus Lauras and others have 
have mentioned uh, today. Uh, this is the copy of the speech that Winston Churchill was working on here in Washington at the embassy the night before he got on the train with President Truman to travel to Missouri with his last minute rhetorical uh, uh, flourishes that he added uh, to the speech. This is also in our archives. Uh, during this 50th anniversary year, uh, others have noticed our story and helped us tell it. Uh, the New York Times, uh, the Los Angeles Times, coast to coast coverage uh, about uh, our story and the great impact the speech continues to have, um, not only in Fulton but throughout the world. Uh, we even made the Minneapolis Star Tribune uh, the Sunday edition when the Final Four was playing in, in, in Minneapolis with great coverage. Uh, and none other but the Wall Street Journal declared Fulton, Missouri as one of the top ten travel destinations in the world. Um, that media attention uh, and the stories that not only the media helps us to tell, but all of you, members, supporters of the museum and the Churchill cause, uh, have, uh, have, have made Winston Churchill's memorial uh, and library, now the America's National Churchill Museum, as designated by Congress, um, uh, in the news. Uh, and we've also seen some great fundraising results, uh, raising just over a million dollars in less than a year, uh, which we're putting uh, to good use to improve the facilities. Uh, the Great Wren Church uh, is 50 years old in Fulton, going on 350. Uh, needs a little nip and tuck, uh, and we're working on that as we speak, uh, making sure that the largest work in our collection, this great memorial that Winston Churchill himself called an imaginative concept, and a symbol of the special relationship between Britain and the United States uh, is preserved for future generations. Um, but as we look back and celebrate, commemorate um, Winston Churchill, we're also looking forward. Uh, we're looking forward to continuing our efforts uh, to engage the next generation, the youngest students, like we did with the special relationship project you saw in the video. Uh, we're expanding our off-site exhibition programs beyond Fulton uh, to do exhibitions coast to coast in this country and beyond, uh, increasing our social media and web presence as well. Not that we're giving up on some of the programs that have been signatures. Uh, in fact, next week, uh, to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Berlin Wall's demise, uh, we're inviting Peter Robinson of the Hoover Institution uh, to Fulton. Some of you will know that Peter Robinson was the speechwriter for President Reagan who penned the Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall speech. Uh, and when Peter, uh, we asked Peter to come, he said, there's no place I'd rather be uh, than Fulton uh, in front of Edwina's sculpture to talk about this speech. And then mark your calendars, please. In St. Louis uh, on April 30th, we're inviting George Will uh, to come speak w with us uh, for a benefit for America's National Churchill Museum uh, in Fulton. So the, the, the list of luminaries, dignitaries who believe in the Churchill cause and believe that the Churchill uh, is still relevant and matters today uh, continues. So I'm very pleased again to be here with you uh, this afternoon uh, to give a warm welcome and thank you for everything you do for the Churchill cause. And for those of you who have been to Fulton recently, thank you for being with us. For those of you who will come in the near future, uh, we look forward to welcoming you, as always, uh, back to Westminster and Fulton. Once again, thank you so much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our lunch program. The afternoon program will begin in 35 minutes at 1.30. So let me remind you, this is an ideal time to visit our silent auction table here and our booksellers down the hall in that direction. We'll see you at 1.30. I'll just post it on Facebook. What would I want for that? That'll be good. That'll be great. Yep. Thanks so much.
We're moving with the time. We have a remote, just like I have. Good. We've got a speaker. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to begin our afternoon program right now. In your program, it says that our next speaker was going to be introduced by Mary Jo Binker. Unfortunately, Mary Jo took ill and is unable to be with us here today. So it is um, the honor of introducing Professor Maurer Falls to me. Professor Maurer is no stranger to these conferences. He's a very popular speaker with us. So just to recap, he is the Alfred Thayer Mahan Distinguished Professor of Sea Power and Grand Strategy at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, and we are happy to welcome him back to the Churchill Conference. John. Thank you, very much. thank you, David, for that introduction, and thank you, Lee, for inviting me here. It is always a great pleasure and honor to be here with the International Churchill Society and be able to speak about Winston Churchill. Now, the theme of this conference has been about the end of the Cold War, the looking at the anniversary of the uh, Berlin Wall coming down. Churchill, of course, in a very famous speech at MIT, said they could look forward to the time when communism would end. Well, today, this year, is also another important anniversary that we should remember, and that is it is the 80th anniversary of the outbreak of the Second World War in Europe. And so this is a, an event, a time, that should be remembered as well. So what I'm going to speak about this afternoon is to look at Churchill's views about why this second Armageddon, as he called it, came about. That's my topic today. And what I want to do is look at the choices that were open to Britain's leaders during the 1930s, what they might have done to avert this Second World War or, if they couldn't avert it, how best to prepare Britain for the trial of strength with Nazi Germany that was to come. Well, uh, I wrote about this recently to mark the 80th anniversary, an article in the journal Orbis, a journal of world affairs published by the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. There are copies of it, hard copies, that are in the room with the books if you choose to read uh, the article that I've written about this subject. And I, in that article, I try to draw out some policy implications for today, what we can learn from the 1930s. Unfortunately, today, too many people say that the 1930s are such a unique period in history, that Hitler is such a, a remarkable, strange individual, that the events of the 1930s somehow can't be replicated. Well, of course, history doesn't repeat itself. But at the same time, at the same time, there are so many lessons to be learned from the study of the 1930s. So we have to pay attention to those lessons. Those lessons are of vital importance for us today when we think about the international environment in which we live and our domestic politics as well. Well, as I said, Churchill said that there could hardly have been a war more easy to prevent than this second Armageddon. That is one of the theses of his book, The Gathering Storm, the first volume of his six-volume history of the Second World War. Now, when we look at the 1930s, we say, uh, is that right? That's a, that's a really tough thesis to have to prove. Everything seems overdetermined. You have Versailles, then you have, of course, the great economic catastrophe, the Great Depression that brought Hitler to power on January 30th, 1933 in Germany, that that in turn sort of sets in train motion toward war, that war is inevitable in some way. Well, Churchill took issue with that inevitability theme, that thesis that somehow the war was inevitable. He argues in the first volume of his Second World War, The Gathering Storm, that the war could have been avoided. So I'm going to look at some of those choices today of how the war could have been avoided. Well, Hitler, a revolutionary, extremist, nationalist, racist, comes to power in Germany. A great deal of his agenda can be read in his book, Mein Kampf, that came out in the 1920s. Uh, when you read Mein Kampf, it's amazing how he laid out so much 
of what his aims, ambitions, and his strategies were to achieve those ambitions. Uh, in the book, you will read that Germany will become a world power or cease to exist. Hitler's ambition is to make Germany a superpower, we would say, the terminology of the time, world power. A country as great as Britain or the United States on the world scene. He understands that this challenge is eventually going to bring Germany into conflict with the British Empire and with the United States. Here's Hitler with a young boy. How old is he? 12? 13? Isn't this a creepy photograph? Look at him. He has his arms around that young boy. And look at his eyes. Wow, that almost looks like demonic possession. Here it is, Halloween. Well, look at that. And you look what a, a, this photograph. It so tells an important story, doesn't it? I've got your children. It's the Pied Piper. He's coming and taking the children away. And what's going to happen to this young boy? Well, we know the story, don't we? He's going to die in the frozen streets of Stalingrad, or he's going to be killed in a submarine in the North Atlantic, or shot down over Britain, right? That's what's going to happen to that generation. The Nazi movement was very popular with young people in Germany. The Nazi movement targeted young people because at the time of the Depression, they're the ones that are dissatisfied with the system. And of course, when you have young men, 15 to 30, who are dissatisfied, well, you get political turbulence and you have danger. That's just simple demographics 101, isn't it? Young men who are unhappy, who don't have a leadership life uh, in their life, father or uncle or older brother, killed on the Western Front in the First World War? Who do they look up to? Well, a decorated World War I veteran, Adolf Hitler. He becomes the adult male figure for a young generation of Germans. And again, they are going to become loyal to him right down to the very end in Berlin in 1945. Well, Churchill right away recognized what was wrong here, that an extremist regime had come into power in Germany. And so in a speech in the House of Commons, he laid out and said, one of the things that we all had been told, that as long as the Weimar Republic, democracy thrived in Germany, that Britain would be safe. Well, that's all changed. It's all changed. Democracy has been overthrown. It's all been swept away. Instead, what did Churchill say? A dictatorship, a most grim dictatorship. That's Shakespearean, isn't it? It's right out of Hamlet. You have not only murder, but murder most foul. You know, recently the Folger had that wonderful exhibit of Churchill and uh, Shakespeare, wonderful exhibit. You can hear here the echoes of Shakespeare. Yes, a very grim dictatorship in Germany. Well, let's look at the choices. I'm going to lay out three choices that were open to British leaders at this time. Choice one, armaments. We've heard about the Cold War arms race. Well, there was also an arms race during the 1930s. And it's an arms race that Churchill believed Britain had to win. There's something worse than an arms race, and that is losing an arms race. Losing an arms race to a country like Nazi Germany. In particular, command of the air. The competition, the arms race and air armaments was critical to Churchill. He understood that on the land, France, was going to have to bear the main burden of fighting Germany. At sea, Britain already had a substantial lead over Germany. But in the air, in the air, there you have a direct competition. Both homelands, Germany and Britain, can be bombed by the other. So these two countries now competing in the air, this is of decisive importance. In the Second World War, command of the air was essential for any successful ground campaign, like the cross-channel attack. It was also essential for winning the Battle of the Atlantic. If you lost command of the air, you would lose the battle. It's critical, and Churchill understood this. 
as you know, he was an air enthusiast. Uh, David Freeman has put together a wonderful edition uh, of, uh, I think it's the last uh, edition, current issue, of uh, Finest Hour that deals with uh, air power, Churchill and air power. Uh, well worth reading. Well, the Nazis understood this, and you see a massive expansion of the German aircraft industry during the 1930s. Look at this, in a short period of time, Germany comes from having a, a rudimentary aircraft industry to where they have built up, built up the infrastructure, the industry, to compete in the air against Britain. Churchill understood this. He understood this, that this build up of German air power had to be, had to be met. Now in 1932, Stanley Baldwin, the leading political figure in interwar Britain, and very honest, said to the British people, whenever the British people are told, they have to remember that man in the street, that the bomber will always get through. This is what the stakes are. And indeed, in the Second World War, the bomber did get through to attack the British homeland, to attack also the German homeland and the Japanese homeland. Uh, we have to remember that in 1940, from August of 1940 around to December of 1940, when the Battle of Britain is being fought, when the Blitz is hitting the British homeland, that about 25,000 British civilians were killed, were killed by German air attacks. Think about that in perspective for Americans in relation to September 11th. It's about seven times the damage, if measured in life, that Britain is taking uh, at this time. It gives you some idea of the punishment that the bomber could inflict on the homelands of great powers at this time. Churchill understood this. He warned about this danger. 1934, he gives a speech. He said, we have to have a big vote to double the Royal Air Force and then have another vote and have it now and then double it again. That was his argument. Germany's making this leap ahead in air power. Britain has to keep pace, at least parity, at least parity in strength with Germany at this time. Well, Neville Chamberlain, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, before becoming Prime Minister, 1937, he said, what are the risks to the country? Well, there's a threat from Germany, but we're just coming out of the Depression. It's the economy, stupid, to quote an advisor to former President Bill Clinton. Uh, that's what's important. That's the biggest risk. You don't want to uh, spend so much on armaments that you hurt the British economic recovery from the Depression. The economic problem, restoring the good health of the economy, is more important in priorities for the government than building up air power relative to Germany. And there's a good argument to be made for that. A healthy economy is the basis for military power. And so Chamberlain is not wrong in that regard. But nonetheless, by focusing so much on the priority of restoring the economy, putting that as the top priority relative to the German uh, air buildup, Britain starts to fall behind. Now, in being critical of Neville Chamberlain, understand that to his left, the Labour Party thought that Chamberlain and the national government were doing too much. In a speech in the House of Commons, Clement Attlee, who would later become Deputy Prime Minister and loyal Lieutenant to Winston Churchill in the Second World War, he says that the Labor Party denies the need for a big buildup in air power. Again, look at his words in the House of Commons. We deny the proposition that the Royal Air Force will make for the peace of the world. Churchill is 180 degrees out from that. He believes that a strong Britain, militarily, will be able to help preserve the peace. It's the best way of trying to preserve the peace. So you can see that we can criticize Neville Chamberlain, but the Labor Party was even more wrong, if you will, at this time, in opposition to what Churchill was arguing at the time. Now, here are some graphs. We have to have some graphs, don't we? OK. This gives you an idea of what defense spending was in the 1930s. In 1932 and 1933, Britain was basically spending double that of England's vulnerable to air attack. Hitler knows that Germany has stolen a march on Britain. They are temporarily ahead in air armaments. It's the time to strike. And again, he tells his generals that we have three times the personnel in the Air Force, the Luftwaffe, 
to the Royal Air Force. Again, there's a window of opportunity here that Nazi Germany has to go with. By losing the arms race, you open up an opportunity for Hitler to strike. And he understands he has to strike before Britain, before Britain is able to catch up. Well, what's the takeaway? Losing an arms race can lead to war. Again, we should remember that these arms competitions matter. They matter a great deal. Choice number two, alliances. Can Britain reach out to other powers? In particular, we've heard about that special relationship between the United States and Britain. In the First World War, Britain and the associated power, the United States, formed a coalition with France. The Atlantic democracies worked together to beat Imperial Germany. By the end of the First World War Armistice Day, there were over two million American soldiers fighting in France. The American army in France was larger than the French army in France in 1918. Again, the U.S. is playing a critical role in winning that war. And here you see a poster from a month or so after Armistice Day, 1918, for a rally in New York City. And you can see side by side Britannia with Uncle Sam. And there's Uncle Sam with his saber and the eagle and the British lion and Britannia with her trident hold, held high. These two countries, the British Empire and the United States work together. The peace of the world is secure. Alas, it didn't work out that way. Now, during the First World War, Churchill understood the importance of the U.S. intervention. He told Admiral Sims, our top naval commander in Europe, uh, uh, he told Admiral Sims, he said, if the U.S. had not entered this war, the Allies, Britain and France, would lose it. That's what he told Admiral Sims. In a speech in 1916, he told an audience, he said, there are two ways of winning this war. This is the First World War, remember, I'm talking about. And they both begin with the letter A. What are those words? Well, one is airplanes, and the other, America. You want to understand Churchill's strategy in the Second World War? Well, here it is being formed in the First World War. Airplanes and America. This is what's going to be decisive in beating back a challenge from Germany. Churchill understands this. To understand the history of the Second World War, you have to know about the First World War. The experiences that Franklin D. Roosevelt had. By the way, he was an early interventionist. He disagreed with President Wilson. He wanted to see the U.S. in the war sooner than what Wilson wanted to take the country into the war. And also Churchill, understanding America's importance, and also this new technology of airplanes, how important they were. Well, Neville Chamberlain had to deal with the U.S. on a whole range of matters, from currency to dealing with war debts. And he confided to one of his sisters, well, Americans, it's a nation of cads. I'm upset by that. <laughs> I'm a cad. Anyway, isn't that a wonderful word, cad? We don't use it anymore, do we? Maybe we should use it some more. Well, anyway, I, th here's, here's Neville Chamberlain, again, one of the leading British political figures, the man who is bringing Britain out of the Great Depression. But he doesn't see cooperation with the U.S. as something that's feasible. The U.S. is not particularly cooperative with Britain. And hence, they are a nation of cads. Uh, by the way, when, Theodore, um, when President Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt's son, uh, James, came over to the UK in 1933, he wanted to meet with Stanley Baldwin, again, the leading political figure in Britain at the time. And uh, Neville Chamberlain, uh, again, recorded in a letter to uh, one of his sisters, said that SB, Stanley Baldwin, he's come to loathe Americans so much he doesn't want to meet with them. He doesn't want to meet with James Roosevelt. Now, he does meet with James Roosevelt, but again, this is what he's thinking. Baldwin, Neville Chamberlain, Americans are not cooperative. They're not helping the situation of economic recovery or international security. Now, Churchill had uh, James Roosevelt out to Chartwell. And uh, uh, the young Roosevelt said, if you could have any wish, what would you want to have? And of course, what's his wish? You know, it's like Aladdin. Uh, you know, you have, I want a thousand wishes. That's what you ask for. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, anyway. anyway. Um, 
<laughs> you know, when, 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 when Churchill is asked, what, what would he, he said, well, of course he's going to say, I want to be prime minister, right? You want to get to the top of the greasy pole. And he says, what else? He wants to be in close daily telephone, that new technology, uh, with the President of the United States. That's what he wants. Again, he has a different picture of the U.S. and just how important it is that Britain and the United States be together. And as he says um, uh, to Roosevelt's son, he said, you know, there's nothing that, uh, that, that they can't accomplish if the U.S. and Britain work together. And that's important. And also that personal relationship between the Prime Minister and the President of the United States. You know, we've talked about summitry today. Again, for leaders to get to know each other, to build trust, to cooperate with each other, to take each other's pulse, to measure them as leaders, and then build up that trust and confidence that goes beyond uh, the, just the basic calculations of strength of countries. Well, anyway, uh, what's uh, Neville Chamberlain's view of the U.S.? Well, in 1934, Britain and the U.S. are trying to pressure Japan to limit Japan's naval armaments. And Neville Chamberlain says, you know, we can't trust the Americans on any of this. A common U.S.-British front, it, it won't work. The Americans will never come through for us. In fact, you know, they, they will always back away from us. They, will, they won't stand with us and try to resist, together with us, aggression. The only way the U.S. will come into the war, if there's an attack on Hawaii or Honolulu, this is 1934, he says this. This is seven years before Pearl Harbor. How did Neville Chamberlain, he must have looked into the crystal ball or something to come up with that one. I mean, pretty amazing. But he said the only way the Americans will come in and help us against Japan is if uh, the Hawaiian Islands are attacked. And uh, again, to give Neville Chamberlain his due, he's correct. Well, failing to a lie, another big takeaway here. What's the result? War. One of the great tragedies of the interwar period is that those Atlantic democracies, the United States, France, Britain, did not cooperate enough. At the end of the First World War, as part of the Treaty of Versailles, the U.S. wanted to give a security guarantee to France. That was rejected by the U.S. Senate and by the American people. American isolationism contributes, contributes to Britain's dire position in facing Nazi Germany. If you don't have the United States to deal with, to help you, to have a security commitment, well, can you stand up to that threat from the East? One of the big takeaways, of course, from the Second World War for American leaders was that we had to make that security commitment, first in the Rio Pact of 1947, and then, of course, the Atlantic Alliance of 1949, and, of course, the agreement in the Atlantic Alliance Article 5, an attack against any one of its members, is considered an attack against all. Again, there was no Atlantic Alliance commitment like that before the Second World War. And it helps explain that Hitler has an opportunity to take one democracy down after another, taking France down in 1940, coming close, if it had not been for Churchill's leadership, taking Britain out in 1940 as well. Again, a very dangerous situation is created when the world's democracies don't form together into a league to preserve the peace. Choice three. Well, if the U.S. won't help you, what do you have to do? Well, Neville Chamberlain considered himself a realist. <clears throat> if you can't stand up, if uh, other countries won't stand with you, with these dictator states, well, then maybe you have to get on good terms with them. Strike a deal. Can you overcome differences? This is what we call appeasement. Today, we wouldn't use the word appeasement because appeasement is now considered a dirty term. The word that is the best cognate synonym for us today would be accommodation. Let's accommodate someone else. And by accommodating them, you turn them into a responsible stakeholder is what we say today. They become part of the system rather than an enemy of the system. Well, Neville Chamberlain is book of speeches that are collected together by Arthur Bryant in search of peace. The, 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 these speeches need to be read. We read Churchill's speeches, right? But you ought to read the counter-argument, if you will. And basically in this, Neville Chamberlain says, look, we have to accommodate ourselves with the dictator states. How are we going to overthrow these regimes? It will require war. 
And if we fight a war, will the U.S. help us? No. So again, for him, the realist option is to come to some sort of terms with Hitler's Germany or Imperial Japan or Mussolini's Italy. Can you cut out those spheres of influence? And if you think Neville Chamberlain is bad, Lloyd George in 1936 went on a visit to Germany where he met Hitler. And then he wrote a newspaper article about meeting uh, Hitler. And what did he have to say in that article? Hitler's the George Washington of Germany. <laughs> this is the man who won the war. Lloyd George's reputation at the end of the First World War, here's the man who won the war, the great war leader against Imperial Germany. And what is he saying now? Why is that? Because he secured Germany's independence from oppressors. What else did he have to say in this article? His popularity among the youth of Germany. That, that is true. He is very strong, Hitler's popularity. The old trust him. Well, maybe. But the young idolize him. Those that are going to be the soldiers, the airmen, and the sailors in the German armed forces of the Second World War. And again, he's worshipped as a national hero because he saved his country. This is what Lloyd George has to say about uh, Hitler. Well, 1938, there was the big crisis over Czechoslovakia, right? Could have been war. Hitler made it clear that he wanted to have the Sudeten Germans, the German-speaking portions of Czechoslovakia, ripped away from the Czech state. And Germans drew up war plans to invade Czechoslovakia. So in the fall of 1938, looks like war is imminent. Neville Chamberlain, using this new technology, flying in the air, a summit, get on good terms with Hitler. Can they solve the problems of Czechoslovakia without war? And Neville Chamberlain meets with Hitler. And of course, it ends up with the Munich Conference, the Munich Agreement. And again, this is what Hitler, uh, Chamberlain is saying about Hitler uh, to his sisters and in his diary. Again, despite that ruthlessness he sees uh, in, in uh, Hitler's face, that he's a man who can be trusted. Well, this shows you some of the dangers of symmetry, right? You know, you think, oh, I built up a rapport, a good, tr yeah, maybe not. Maybe he's deceiving you. Hitler's very good at deception. And again, the tumultuous return when Neville Chamberlain comes back waving the piece of paper, and here it is. And again, what's the thesis of this agreement where he has Hitler sign it at the last moment? And again, it's the desires of our two people never to be at war with one another again. Avoid war. No great war again with Germany. Of course, Hitler had this shoved in front of him at the last moment. He didn't want to sign it, but he realized he had to sign it because otherwise he would lose the propaganda battle with Neville Chamberlain. And so he signed it, but he told his intimates around him. He said, that old man with his umbrella ever comes again to Germany. I'm going to throw him down the steps and kick him in front of photographers. Again, is that a relationship of trust? <laughs> well, again, Neville Chamberlain is lauded for peace. But in the great speech in the House of Commons, I wish we had some of the film footage the, that we have for a later period of time of the Cold War of this speech in the House of Commons. But Churchill lays out clearly the ideological struggle that's here, a struggle at the heart of Western civilization between the Nazi view of the world and democracy. And he highlights the ideological component here. You have to consider the character of the Nazi movement. And what is the Nazi movement? Well, he lays it out in a very clear way. Spurns Christian ethics, cheers barbarous paganism, vaunts a spirit of aggression and conquest, derives perverted pleasure from persecution, again, uses pitiless brutality in the threat of murderous force. All of these things are the attributes of the Nazi movement. And he's laying it out in a very clear and direct way to the British people and to the world. Again, in his speeches, again, collected into battle, there can be no real understanding between British democracy and Nazi power. Well, in a speech in October 1938 to America, broadcast on NBC, Churchill lays out again this ideological struggle. Arms are important. Can't lose the arms race, but it's not enough. You have to have the power of ideas on your side. What do you stand for? 
Well, again, it's for liberty, democracy. Now, Hitler takes note of the speech. Hitler paid close attention to what Churchill said and did. And in his rebuttal speech of the same month, Hitler highlights that there's been people out there, Churchill, who wants to divide the world into these ideological camps, authoritarian states. And notice that Hitler then qualifies, what does he mean by an authoritarian state? A disciplined state. What does that mean for democracy? They're not disciplined. They're caught up by partisan politics. There's no discipline in that country, whereas Germany is disciplined. Authoritarian regimes are disciplined. Well, a month later, you have the Reichskristallnacht. You have the destruction of Jewish synagogues here, synagogue in Hanover, the looting of Jewish stores, beating up uh, uh, German Jews on the streets. This is showing what Churchill said in his October speech about Nazi power. In January of 1939, in response to a message from President Roosevelt, in a speech to the Reichstag, Hitler lays out this threat, that if the Jews of international finance again bring about a war, and for him, again, it's international finance of the Jews are responsible for British and American foreign policy. Behind the scenes, they're the puppet master. They're controlling with their strings the marionettes of British and American political leaders. That if they plunge the world into the war, what will the result be? Well, as he says, and here's the German translation, you know, translation into English from the German, it's the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. Again, Vernichtung, destruction, annihilation. Can't be clear. Hitler's laying out already the ideas, the conception that's going to lead those railway lines right to Auschwitz. Well, in 1939, the war breaks out uh, uh, after Czechoslovakia. The Czech state is destroyed in 19, March of 38, or 39. Churchill, again, looks vindicated. Everything that he said in his October uh, speeches uh, shows that Nazi Germany is behaving according to what he characterized the Nazi regime. In Britain, he becomes a more popular figure. As you can see, the British public is starting to say there has to be a stand against Germany, especially after March of 1939 and the Munich Agreement is destroyed by Hitler. Churchill is the one that has been honest and forthright the British public are starting to rally behind him. He should be in the government. Hitler had already understood that Churchill was going to be his opponent. In 1937, 1937, he told Ribbentrop that within five years, the British will sort of have a backbone. And when they do, when the British public starts to understand the threat from Germany, what will happen? Churchill will be in power, and Germany will be in a fine net, a mess at that point. And he says he's not going to wait. Again, there's a window of opportunity. He has to strike before Churchill has power. Again, Churchill is the one that will weave a web of coalitions around Germany. He has to strike before Churchill has the power. Well, what's the bottom line, the big takeaway? Appeasement here leads to war. Well, Stalin, we've heard about Stalin and Stalin's Russia, joins up in August of 1939, comrades in crime, with Hitler, to destroy the Polish state. And in a rapid campaign in September and October, Poland is overrun from the west by the German armies and in the east by the Soviet Red Army. Poland's wiped out. Winston's back. Now with the war on, this iconic photograph on the post, picture post that we're familiar with, he's back at the Admiralty again. In Chamberlain's cabinet, standing right behind Neville Chamberlain, and with his board of admiralty there, admirals and senior civil servants. Now in Germany, when it's reported that Churchill's back at the admiralty, they understand that now Britain is going to be stronger. Why? Because they have a strong leader who's coming into power. And again, this is from Albert Speer's uh, book, Inside the Third Reich. Goering was in talking with Hitler. He comes out. They've heard the news that Churchill is back. Goering just drops down into a chair. And he says, Churchill's in the British government. That means the war is really on. 
They have a real war on their hands. They're not dealing now just with Neville Chamberlain. They're going to have a real war. Again, Hitler has taken a measure of <laughs> Churchill and sees him as a threat. At first, Churchill said he and Chamberlain were uneasy with each other, but grew closer over time. But already, within a month of the war's outbreak, people are talking about when will Churchill replace Chamberlain? Our ambassador, Joseph Kennedy, says this to his wife Rose in a letter to his wife Rose. If Churchill becomes prime minister, then England's in trouble. That's what our ambassador is, send, is, is thinking about what's going on. Churchill's not a blessing, but actually a curse to Britain. Uh, Churchill, why? He has energy brains, but no judgment. How often is Churchill characterized throughout his life as having no judgment? Again, that's a constant uh, refrain. Well, what does uh, Joseph Chamberlain record in his diary? Look at this. He says, Churchill impressed me that if he blew up the American embassy, he would blame the Germans for it, just so he could get the US into the war. Is this the type of ambassador you want to have at this critical moment in 39 and 40? And of course, the answer is no. And Roosevelt understands this and reaches out to Churchill, former naval person. Joseph Kennedy can't stand the fact that Roosevelt is reaching out, going around the embassy uh, to communicate with uh, Churchill. Well, we've heard about Maisky, Ambassador Maisky from the Soviet Union. Again, he reports, uh, puts in his diary, that there's now fresh blood in the British government because Churchill and Eden have been brought on board. But he also, he has a different view from Joseph Kennedy. He says if this reconstruction doesn't go further, what's the result going to be? Well, Churchill and Eden are going to be isolated hostages and Britain will lose the war. Again, maisky has got a better impression of what needs to be done here. Uh, a better understanding that Churchill has to have more power, not less power. Well, here's the iconic Karsh photograph of Churchill. Let me leave you with just uh, a few thoughts. As I've tried to highlight already, it is important for the world's democracies to stick together in a league. We have to work together. The world becomes much more dangerous when the world's democracies don't cooperate with each other. We have to keep that as a vital interest at the center of American foreign policy and grand strategy. That's critical. Another takeaway is that when the world's authoritarian powers start to work together, and you see this with Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Russia, the world becomes a much more dangerous place as much as possible, you have to keep those authoritarian states at each other's throats and not together against us. We also have to be prudent and understand that no matter how much we want peace, peace will come by those who are prepared to stand up for it by investing in what is needed in defense effort to be strong. The weak will not have peace. Thank you very much. Just uh, five minutes for Q and A uh, discussion. Yes, right here. Thank you. This, this is a dangerous geopolitical challenge. We saw it during the height of the Cold War when Mao and Stalin were working together. Uh, of course, Nixon, Kissinger were able to break it apart, but they broke apart because Mao and, and uh, Stalin's successors went at odds with each other. Uh, one of our key goals should be to try to break apart Russia from China in any way that we can. Unfortunately, the deal that you might have to cut uh, to get cooperation from uh, Russia is one that we don't want to pay. Uh, I think we have to play a long game here, and we're capable of playing a long game, which is to look to a post-Putin Russia and hope that there might be some openings, just as Churchill saw and was highlighted in the earlier talks in a post-Stalin Russia that you look uh, ahead. George Kennan, who wrote the famous X article about containment, you know, was thinking about uh, 
change, regime change that comes from inside and dealing with a new generation of leaders. And so I think that's how we have to look at things today. Uh, China has gotten much, much stronger. Its economy, its economic growth has uh, helped fuel a military buildup uh, in some of the latest technologies, in particular precision ballistic missiles uh, and crews that put uh, all of our bases in the Pacific as well as naval forces. They also have a nuclear arsenal that uh, has been growing and getting more powerful. So all of those things we have to uh, make investments in. Uh, to help ensure that there's a, a balance in the Far East. And in addition to that, of course, we have to work with our key allies there, in particular Japan and Australia. Uh, it's just critically important. So thank you. Yeah, I hope that gets to your question. Yeah, here. Yeah. Um, do you feel that if Brexit passes that, oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Do you feel that if Brexit passes and uh, England breaks away from the EU, uh, that that'll build a stronger relationship between the United States and Britain? I, I, I must confess I am not an expert on uh, Brexit, but looking at uh, European politics as a, as a whole, um, since the end of the Cold War, I think, I look at the transatlantic relationship there, uh, we, we have to uh, revitalize all of those uh, relationships, not just between the special relationship between Britain and the U.S., but also with Germany and the U.S. Um, we, we have to do a better job of confronting uh, the realities that we face uh, of a potential of the threat from Russia. Russia, with its large nuclear arsenal, remains such a grave danger to the U.S. It's uh, really the the existential threat to the U.S. So we have to have a relationship with Russia, and I would prefer it be one that comes from a position of strength when uh, the Atlantic Alliance, the coalition, coheres together, not just on military matters, but also on uh, economic matters with regard to the uh, uh, Russia. Uh, so I don't mean to dodge your question, but uh, I think the whole set of relationships between the U.S. and Europe, we have to do a better job of making that job one in some way. I think we fret so much about Russia and China, we forget that maybe our first job should be to make sure we get along well with our coalition partners, especially the world's democracies. And w Western Europe, again, you know, it is <laughs> democracies, you know, with us. And so we, we th that, that's key. That's the key element there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Maurer. Uh, before we take our next break, a uh, couple of announcements to make. Um, some found items. We found a room key, in case you can't get back into your room. And probably somebody's worried about where their cell phone is. Found one of those, too. <laughs> I'd like to remind you once more about our silent auction. And um, also that um, Mark Kuritz from the Churchill Book Collector, many of you visited his room already, and um, just to let you know, those photographs that he's got for sale there, this is the first time they've ever been available for sale. It's a fascinating collection of press photographs, and I'm sure um, many of them will tempt you. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session will begin promptly at 2.30. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is a great pleasure. Can you hear me? Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Mr. Leonard Moulton, uh, a man who holds a unique place in the pantheon of film critics and historians, not only due to his numerous TV appearances and best selling books, but also um, he is the first character to have appeared, or first person to have appeared as an animated version of himself in an episode of South Park. Um, <laughs> I think you can also safely say that there's no one alive today who has seen more movies than he has. Um, he is quite literally hooked on Hollywood, to quote a, a title from one of his books. His writing is always extremely varied, highly researched, and charming. He's even written an entire essay about the use of music in the film Casablanca. Um, and with books such as 151 Best Movies You've Never Seen, he's ensured that some of us have seen them, and provided a vital service to our collective memory and culture and to future generations of film lovers to come. Um, I'm delighted he'll talk today about Churchill and the movies, a subject which opens itself up to endless interpretation and on which um, it's fascinating to hear an American perspective. So um, please join me. It's a great pleasure for me. Uh, genuinely, I've been looking forward to this for some time, and I think we're in for a real treat. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Leonard Moulton. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, John. I've had a sneak peek at John's documentary. You're in for a treat. You really are, uh, to be redundant and <laughs> use the same expression. Um, when I was asked to do this, uh, I said, well, just how many portrayals of Churchill have there been in movies and television? And I think the answer is countless. I truly do. And I was trying to think, well, who else would compete with him in terms of just sheer volume, sheer number of portrayals in films and television? I don't think anybody comes close. Now, if you limit the competition, so to speak, to just the last 10 to 15 years and include uh, relatively new forms like miniseries and uh, cable TV movies and such, uh, then the docudrama, you know, ha having now reared its head and uh, certainly here to stay, w would, would swell the numbers of, of films where you'd find Franklin D. Roosevelt, Dwight D. Eisenhower, uh, and others, but Churchill tops them all. And so many, as I've been doing homework for this and watching, revisiting a lot of films and discovering some new ones that I didn't know about, I think that if you are a British actor and you haven't been asked to play Churchill, <laughs> it's kind of like being a British actor and not having gotten an offer to be in a Harry Potter movie. My family and I joke about that. You know, how ignominious must it be if you're a member of British Actors' Equity and you never got to play in a Harry Potter movie? The shame of it all. Uh, so what I've been doing the last couple of weeks is watching every great British actor of our generation, pretty much, uh, tackling this, uh, this challenge. And Part of the challenge is that it's so easy to be a caricature of Winston Churchill. That's a rel relatively simple matter. We all know, you know, the, the uh, actors love bits of business, so having the cigar as a prop, great. Uh, having the, uh, the jowls, okay. Uh, you know, the, 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 the voice, the, the timber of the voice, uh, the, the bowler hat or the Hamburg, uh, all of those things make it, you know, one step easier, I'm not saying easy, but easier for an actor to inhabit the, uh, uh, the guise of uh, the, the great man himself. Doing it well, doing it skillfully, doing it with the kind of nuance that makes the character really come to life. That's, that's another matter. That's on a different level of uh, merit and sophistication. And uh, you will all undoubtedly have your own favorites. 
uh, and I, I know that I am preaching to very much the choir here. Uh, but I, when I started thinking about this and the whole phenomenon of portraying real life uh, individuals of some celebrity on screen, I go back to my childhood and uh, my youth, I should say, and the first time I saw a movie I, I genuinely love, Yankee Doodle Dandy, with James Cagney in an Oscar-winning performance as the great showman George M. Cohan. And it's framed, with uh, bookended as they say, with a scene of him having an audience with President Roosevelt in 1942. The early days of World War II, of America's involvement in World War II. And it's a scene that made a deep impression on me as a kid because you only see President Roosevelt from the back. You see him sitting in his chair, you see the back of his head. They have an actor impersonating his voice, but you never see him. And as, a, as an impressionable kid, I thought, gee, what reverence and respect they clearly had for the office of the presidency, that it would somehow be unseemly to, you know, have, you know, an actor, you know, impersonating him. How wrong I was. Uh, it was that case in that film. But in fact, in 1937, the real George M. Cohan starred in a famous play called I'd Rather Be Right, written by Moss Hart and George S. Kaufman, in which he indeed portrayed FDR. And that's recreated in Yankee Doodle Dandy. And uh, it, it was a, a, a lightly satirical play uh, about the populist president. And uh, so uh, there, was, there was, irreverence was alive and well in the 1930s. Let's just put it that way. It's not a new thing. It's not a, a creation of our modern era. Uh, the, what's more, the, the, one of the most popular radio programs of that time was called the March of Time. Uh, Time being a, a pun because it was sponsored by Time magazine. And on that show, which dramatized news events on a weekly basis, FDR was, of course, a central figure for all the years he was in office and was uh, very, uh, uh, very much imitated uh, as, a, as a regular feature of the show. And one of the people who did that imitation was Art Carney. Uh, and, uh, so, so FDR had his, had his time in, in the show business spotlight. Mr. Churchill did not until some years later. Uh, somebody will undoubtedly correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it was only after his death that he became, uh, I, I guess, fair game for, uh, for writers, filmmakers, television producers. And the uh, many, many documentaries dating back to the, the, the 60s, the late 50s and early 60s. But uh, Young Winston, which I, I assume most of you have seen, 1972, was the first attempt at a bio biographical film. And that's, of course, based on Churchill's own book, My Early Life. And uh, a young actor named Simon Ward was cast as Churchill and uh, uh, did a decent, creditable job. But the problem with that film is it's kind of like watching films about young Mr. Lincoln. Since we already know what happened to young Mr. Lincoln and what happened to young Mr. Churchill, it has, it has some awkward moments. Uh, his father... Randolph, played by uh, Robert Shaw, says it, it one the scene, oh, what's to become of you? You know, we know what's to become of him. <laughs> no suspense there. That's the problem with doing a retroactive uh, biography. Uh, th th there's a film, you'll you forgive me if I ramble a bit, because it just comes naturally to me. Um, <laughs> and as I get older, it'll become more natural to me, I'm sure. <laughs> If you want to see bad biographical films, uh, one that was not a great hit in its time, but uh, they, they made uh, the Benny Goodman story in 1955. And uh, Benny's mother, portrayed by Ellie McMahon, is always saying to him, uh, 
Oh, Benny, don't be that way. Benny, don't be that way. What's the name of Benny's first big hit? Don't be that way. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock directed a biography of Richard Strauss called Waltzes from Vienna, which may set an all-time record for bad biographical dialogue. Uh, I won't try to describe how they created the Blue Danube Waltz. You'll have to see it for yourself. Uh, and it's worth seeing for that scene. Uh, there are lots of bad Hollywood biographies. Uh, uh, Swanee River, where Don Amici plays uh, Stephen Foster. <laughs> Cause, uh, well, any, if you want a good chuckle, you might check that one out. But for Churchill, uh, of course, the stakes have been raised as each new prominent actor tackles the part. Uh, you know, chronologically speaking, I, I'm checking my notes to make sure I'm not getting anything wrong. In 1994, there was a TV movie called When Lions Roared with Bob Hoskins as Churchill, John Lithgow as FDR, and Michael Caine as <laughs> typecasting, Joseph Stalin. <laughs> Almost, but arguably not as uh, unlikely as uh, Robert Duvall playing Stalin in an HBO movie. But, you know, that's what actors do. And some of them, you know, get away with it more easily than others. Uh, in, uh, in 1990, no, I'm getting my, 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 my I'm tripping on my own uh, things here. I'm going to put one major appearance aside and move to 2002, what I'll call the modern era of Churchill on screen, with Albert Finney. Albert Finney's one of the greatest actors of uh, our generation, and uh, he's known as a chameleon. I mean, this is a man who played Hercule Poirot in Murder on the Orient Express and was not only unrecognizable, but, you know, affected uh, both the, the, the sound, the, the, the vocal uh, uh, part of that, that character, but convinced you that he was Hercule Poirot. And then later played FDR in Annie, uh, a film I wish they hadn't made. But I, I really like the show. I just, that film gets on my nerves. Uh, Finney, is, is, as I say, is, is a guy who can, can convince you he's almost anybody. And he did a good job as Churchill. Uh, but I didn't buy it. It seemed too much like an actor playing Churchill rather than being Churchill. And uh, I'm not an actor by trade. I, I don't know all the lingo. But... I know that uh, the, the goal of most actors is to convince you that, you're, that they're not giving a performance. That you're actually seeing somebody inhabit or bring to life the character in question. And so to me, Albert Finney, great as he is, uh, is almost there but not quite. Again, the, the makeup is there. The voice, or the approximation of the voice is there. And the film is good. It's called The Gathering Storm. It was done for HBO uh, in conjunction with the BBC. And of course, you have uh, Vanessa Redgrave. There, for every great actor, there's been a great actress playing Clementine. Uh, and in this case, Vanessa Redgrave, one of the greatest. Uh, but what's funny is if you go to uh, just watch a trailer or a clip of it online, the first face you, you may see, if, any, if you land on the same film clip that I did, is a guy who was unknown at the time named Tom Hiddleston playing Winston's son. And it's like, wait a minute. That's that guy Loki from the Marvel movies, which is obviously not your bread and butter, but for millions of others, that's a big deal. So now you have a Marvel villain in the same orbit as the Churchills. Uh, in 2009, Brendan Gleeson, another great actor, played Churchill, with Janet McTeer, a great actress, as Clemmy, and Len Cariou as FDR. Again, you know, we're talking about the cream of the crop here. Uh, 
in, in 2009, Quentin Tarantino, not a historian by trade, <laughs> as I think he would be the first to admit, maybe the second to admit, um, cast Rod Taylor, who I always loved growing up, uh, who, by the way, an Aussie, not that that matters anymore, uh, in his film Inglorious Bastards, which again, is more a fantasy than even a, a pallid attempt at history, uh, as in very brief appearance as Churchill. Great to see Rod Taylor, maybe not in that part. Uh, in The King's Speech, which was a wonderful movie, Timothy Spall, another great British actor, played Churchill in a relatively minor part in, in that particular film. And so it goes, on and on and on down the line. The, the other great names I'll just mention briefly, Michael Gambon, one of the finest British actors, uh, in a film called Churchill's Secret about his, his stroke. And uh, that was Lindsay Duncan, a fine actress who is not quite a star to most people, but she's one of the best of the, the new, newish generation of actresses. 2018, Brian Cox, who's now playing a, uh, a paraphrase of Rupert Murdoch uh, on television uh, in succession, played Churchill in a film called simply Churchill uh, about the 96 hours leading up to D-Day with Miranda Richardson, another great actress, as Clemmy, and John Slattery, good casting. You may remember him from Mad Men. Uh, it's a white-haired, uh, uh, very slender fellow, as, a, as Eisenhower. So all of these great, great actors. So why do three on top of my list? I'm going to tell you the three that I selected as my favorites, uh, not necessarily in, in, in chronological order. First and foremost, to my mind, is perhaps the least celebrated actor, Robert Hardy. Robert Hardy in the eight-part miniseries, Into the Wilderness, to me is the best actor I've seen play Churchill. Uh, the, 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 the series, which is not easy to find except if you go to YouTube, where everything now resides online, and where, in fact, we saw that wonderful clip at the Anderson House last night. That was out of, off of YouTube. Uh, Trying to, if you want to stream it, I was not able to find a place to legally stream The Wilderness Years, or I could spend $200 to buy one used DVD, which I chose not to do because I found the whole series on YouTube. And, and what a terrific show it is. It's not great filmmaking. It's kind of stilted uh, to, to my eyes as, as filmmaking. But as storytelling, excellent. Uh, they had the, uh, the benefit of uh, a noted Churchill historian, Martin Gilbert, as a consultant and co-producer on the show. But Robert Hardy is the one who really shines because though he was a character actor and well-known in, in England, he starred on All Things Great and Small, a series that many of you may have seen uh, when it played here on PBS. Uh, he's had a fine career. He lived to, to be 91. And, uh, and he, he did wind up in four Harry Potter films, playing uh, the, the character Cornel Cornelius Fudge, who is the uh, Minister of Magic for the UK, if you're keeping track. <laughs> to me, Hardy seemed to be the least concerned about the externals of the performance. But he got all the internal things right. He does seem to be Winston Churchill blustery at times, petulant at other times, uh, very much in love with Clementine, played by Sean Phillips, uh, but uh, hesitant, repressed in so many ways, uh, uh, really uh, harboring mixed feelings of, of devotion and, uh, what shall I call it, uh, aloofness, perhaps alcohol-fueled at times, 
And though they lead separate lives, when he comes to America in the 1930s to give his, to on his lecture tour, he misses her terribly and says so, and says that he misses talking to her. And uh, uh, it's a very touching portrayal of their relationship. Uh, there's not a lot of bluster. Of course, it is a younger Churchill, to be sure, but still, there's, uh, uh, there's a feeling of watching a, uh, a, a man of great achievement who is still not accepted. Well, th that's why it's called the wilderness years, as, as you could tell me better than I could tell you. Uh, but he's, he's thwarted in so many ways, and that's uh, the, why the, that period is so interesting to, uh, to learn about and to, or to revisit if you know it well. Um, he wound up, uh, th that also was made for British television, played on American television, and he did so well that he was asked to repeat that role over and over and over again uh, in um, TV movies like The Woman He Loved, and even an episode of Agatha Christie's Marple, uh, and in a TV movie called Churchill, 100 Days That Saved Britain. So he kind of grew older into the part over the years. Uh, he, he's fairly youngish when he tackled it in, 19, in 1981, uh, and uh, aging did not uh, harm his his career as the man who plays Churchill. If anything, it aided and abetted his ability to do so as the, the story moved on to, to its uh, later chapters. The next actor I would name, I'm gonna save that one, I'm gonna do it in reverse order. Well, Gary Oldman. Now, Gary Oldman has played so many different people on screen and I called Albert, Kenny, uh, Albert Finney a chameleon. Gary Oldman is not just a chameleon. He's a deeply committed actor. Uh, one of his first films that really gained attention on this side of the Atlantic was Sid and Nancy, where he played the punk rocker Sid Vicious and threw himself into the part completely, though having apparently very little acquaintance with that, the punk scene. But he's an actor who does his homework. I interviewed him at the time of uh, uh, the John le Carré movie, uh, and he told me he looked at over 100 pairs of glasses to find just the frame he thought was right to play George Smiley. I mean, that's a man who's looking, who knows what he's looking for and isn't satisfied till he finds it. Because it's not just a prop to him, it's part and parcel of the man he is going to portray. I know something that isn't written about very much, if at all. Uh, he was going to play Charlie Chaplin in Richard Attenborough's film Chaplin and pretty much had the part when Robert Downey Sr. got through to him and said, you've got to see my son. You've simply got to see my son. So he gave Robert Downey Jr. a hearing or an audition or a meeting and was convinced that he was the right guy. And my wife and I were thinking at the time, I remember we were walking our dogs one night and thinking they'd announced they were going to make a movie about Chaplin's life and we thought, who could play Chaplin? And we said, well, it's got to be somebody preferably British, again, preferably, uh, slender, agile, with the ability to evoke Chaplin just enough that, you, that, that he would convince you for a span of two hours that he was that man. So Gary Oldman was bypassed in favor of Robert Downey Jr., who did a ter terrific job. I don't think the movie is terrific, but I think he is really, really good in it. But Gary Oldman, I think, would have been his equal with the advantage of being British. But he says he wouldn't have made the film if, and I want to try to pronounce this right, Kazuhiro Tsuji didn't say yes. That's the makeup genius who designed the Churchill look for Oldman. He, 
uh, it took four hours to apply every morning and one hour to remove. And Suji, uh, who, who has worked on very high profile films, had left filmmaking. He did not enjoy the, the process of movie making uh, with the second guessing and the egos and, and the hours. But when he read the script for Anthony McCartan's script for Darkest Hour and saw what a, it had the potential to be a great movie and knew Gary Oldman was going to throw himself into this part, he said, okay, I'll make one more movie with you. He designed them, and, and, and Gary Oldman knew his work well enough that he knew that that was going to be the, t the tipping point that would put him over the top and sell us all on the idea that he was Winston Churchill, which he did. Because you can't see that there's any makeup. <laughs> it's invisible makeup. And that's part of what they're able to do now, that what a, a genius, and I think I'll call him that, Kevin Suji is, and he studied with Rick Baker, seven-time Oscar-winning makeup artist Rick Baker, and had the same mentor as Rick Baker, the great Dick Smith, who's best remembered, I guess, for, for The Exorcist, but who worked on dozens and dozens of films and television shows and is considered uh, a pioneer of, of modern-day makeup. You remember a film called Little Big Man with Dustin Hoffman where he ma made him look 100 years old? That was Dick Smith who did that, and that was some 35 years ago or so, before new techniques and new, uh, new materials were, were available. Having that makeup be invisible allowed Gary Oldman to simply concentrate on acting. And so to, to me, that's the marvel there, is that through that and through a, a really fine script, he does become Winston Churchill. In the same way that uh, uh, John C. Riley and Steve Coogan became Laurel and Hardy last year in Stan and Ollie. And I, I, Stan and Ollie uh, are embedded in my consciousness. I grew up watching them every day of my life when they were on local television. And for a baby boomer like me, that was a daily treat to see them. And when I watched these two actors on screen, I didn't see actors at all. I saw Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. That's because makeup has progressed to this you know, zenith now, just as visual effects have. So that's what, that, to me, it's the two ingredients that make for a great Churchill. Great writing and a great performance. And if either one of those two ingredients is, is lacking, it can be good, but it's not going to be great. And the proof of that pudding, if you'll pardon a scrambled metaphor, is John Lithgow in The Crown. Because John Lithgow looks nothing like Winston Churchill. And most importantly, he's tall and slim. <laughs> and when I heard that they had cast him, I said, are they out of their minds? How do you, how do you cast a man who looks like that as Winston Churchill? And the answer is, part of the answer is, he's a great actor. And a great actor can persuade you, but only if he has a great screenplay, great script. That's where Peter Morgan enters the picture. Peter Morgan is a, a playwright and screenwriter who has had, who had enjoyed some success, some modest success, and then he hit on something, it's not a formula, but he hit on an idea that has buoyed his career and made him a major name in both film, uh, on stage, on, in film, and on television. The idea was write about real people and be willing to write about people who are still alive, which takes a certain amount of chutzpah, to use an old-fashioned British expression, and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and a keen ear. He's the man who wrote uh, two films about Tony Blair and Queen Elizabeth. One of them was made for television. The other one became a feature film. 
he wrote a film I love called Frost Nixon. First, that was a play, actually. It was a British stage play that then became a really fine film. He wrote The Last King of Scotland, about Idi Amin, uh, and, and, and many, many others. And he's the one who created The Crown and has written many of the episodes. And when I, when I went back to revisit just the Churchill material, I was really stunned by how convincing John Lithgow was. More convincing sitting down than standing or getting out of a car, which they show him doing several times, where they've almost made him a hunchback. Uh, they, they built up his shoulders you know, tremendously uh, to try to de-emphasize the narrowness of, of his body. So he's not in the same class as Gary Oldman in terms of the, the physical appearance. But because Peter Morgan is such a skillful writer and John Lithgow is such a superb actor, I, now I can't speak for you folks, you, you, I'm sure there'll be differences of opinion, but he, he persuaded me. And again, that's an actor's job. But he can't do it by himself. He has to have not just the words, but the big picture as well as the, the, the the, the right dialogue, the right motivations, and all of that. And that's what Morgan does so well. Even he has had l lessons to learn over the course of his career. I read an, an article that he wrote for the Writers Guild magazine and then happened to meet him about a week later at an event in Hollywood. And I asked him about it. He wrote this piece about The Queen, the, the film The Queen, where Helen Mar Mirren played uh, Queen Elizabeth and won an Oscar for it. He wrote the part meaning to depict her as being cold. But he admits he didn't reckon with an actress of such skill and nuance as Helen Mirren. And that simply by having somebody like that bring his words to life, she made the, the queen seem more human more empathetic than he ever intended originally. Isn't that interesting? She, she brought warmth to the character. And he, he doesn't feel that his, his, uh, his work was subverted in any way. It just came as a mild surprise to him. Because he, like, he's still learning, as any great artist is. He's still learning, and that's a lesson that he learned most emphatically by having a great actress take on that role. And so with John Lithgow, uh, I don't know what it would be like to read the screenplay, you know, not having seen the actual finished product of the series, but it'd be interesting to compare and see if it comes to life on the page the way it does in the television show. And those are my three favorites. And uh, uh, I would still rank Robert Hardy possibly at, at the very top of that, that heap. Heap sounds a terrible word. <laughs> but uh, on, that, on that scale, and that's no disrespect to any of the other exceptionally fine actors who've taken on Churchill. But it is a, a, a deep bow to a man who, if not a star, certainly gave a star-worthy performance in a, in a show that is worth revisiting if you haven't lately. Uh, and I would like to, to, to hear what you folks have to say about this, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about this or anything else uh, you care to discuss. Oh, we're going to pass a microphone to you, apparently. Here it comes. I have a question. Um, I agree with you, basically, but there is one thing which has always disturbed me, and also with Gary Oldman and 
the darkest hour, and that is when they portray Churchill. There is a type of silliness, silliness or quirkiness around his personality, which isn't correct. Uh, also, if you take uh, you know the Norman, the D Day, he is portrayed as uh, they don't portray the gravitas that he really had. Uh, you know, when you see him. In, in movies or read about him, there's always some, I think also Gary Oldman to some extent makes him slightly silly. Uh, at least that's how I perceive it. Also that uh, scene in this tube or subway, you know, why do they make up things which are not correct? The, the well, reality is enough, sort of. <laughs> well, that's why it's good to have documentaries that, uh, that are more devoted to the literal truth. I, I teach at USC in Los Angeles, and I tell my students, don't get your history from the movies. <laughs> Even the ones that say based on a true story or inspired by real events, maybe especially those. <laughs> uh, as soon as you are creating a movie, you're, you're departing from reality because it's a movie. And so even movies with the best intentions and the uh, greatest fidelity to facts are still movies. They're, they're following dramatic structure. They're, uh, they're vulnerable to the, uh, the whims of a writer or a director or an actor. And uh, you, you just can't trust movies uh, as a blanket statement. Uh, and, of course, movies always have to telescope uh, time and sometimes uh, create new characters, create scenes that may or may not have taken place. I, you know, Peter Morgan in The Queen imagines, imagines dialogue taking place uh, uh, between Elizabeth and her husband, Philip, that no one has ever documented. How do we know what they discuss, you know, when they're alone in their bedchambers. You know, that, that's impossible to document. But he felt confident enough, and again, that chutzpah comes back into play. He felt confident enough to write scenes like that, let alone, you know, scenes that are, are less private, that may have had some, somebody listening in. So movies are movies. And, and they, uh, uh, you know, they're never, going to, uh, they're never going to be reality. It's just the nature of the beast. If something struck, struck, strikes you as uh, silly, as you said, or, uh, or exaggerated in some way, uh, that's, that's your perception of it. It may not be everybody's perception of it. A hush falls over the crowd. Yes. Yes, sir. Do we know if Winston, being the cinema fan that he was, ever expressed any sort of preference or guidance for his own portrayal? I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, as we know, he was not averse to building his own character. And no one played Winston Churchill better than Winston Churchill. He was keenly aware of his public image and uh, keenly aware of the power of both radio and movies uh, and, uh, and public perception. Uh, so he lived up to his reputation. He, many historians uh, that I've read you know, uh, say that he was very aware of building a certain mythology about himself. Uh, he realized that the cigar and the hat became trademarks, uh, that he shouldn't uh, avoid them in any way. And uh, uh, so, you know, he, he sort of set the bar pretty high, didn't he? But I don't know that he ever voiced uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, thought about being literally portrayed by someone else. Leonard, in your research, um you learned a lot about the 
fact that Churchill loved the movies and some of the movies that he enjoyed. What impressions did you form of Churchill based on learning about what his favorite films were and who his favorite actors were? Well, I, 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 dare, dare, I don't know if I dare say this, but I think we had similar tastes. <laughs> <laughs> that isn't too flippant to say, uh, but you know, I, I, I like that Hamilton woman too. <laughs> not to the degree that he did apparently. Uh, I've not seen it eight times or more, uh, but I, I revere Charlie Chaplin. Uh, to me, Chaplin is kind of the uh, sort of the fount from which so much uh, of movie history and performance art and silent film comedy and pantomime uh, come from. So those are two instances where I can say Mr. Churchill and I would have gotten along. Again, not meaning to be flippant. No one wants to argue with me. <laughs> I'm not looking for argument. I was just. Say that the broadcast was on, in which he said, uh, "I hate Winston Churchill," and I remember it created a whole storm uh, of response. That article that was in the New York Times, and uh, Burton, what a great actor, and yet, wow, what a terrible portrayal, in my opinion. Well, yes, he was not at his best when he made that, that film. Well, I, you know, and he, he didn't try in the way of makeup at all, you know, no shaved head or, or anything. And at times he seems like he's on some psychedelic drug, you know, as he's doing uh, Churchill speeches. Uh, you know, how, how is it that such a great actor like Burton can not really get into the part? Many people feel that Richard Burton uh, drank away his great gift as an actor. And of course, that majestic voice of his, you know, just one of the great voices. And he narrated, you know, that famous documentary series uh, about Mr. Churchill. Uh, but by the time he did that, that performance, he was uh, not, in, uh, not in fine fettle, to put it mildly. And, uh, and that's kind of a shame. That's kind of a shame. So I, I, I agree with you completely. Yes. Uh, they, they abandoned the microphone just a moment too soon. Here it comes. Okay. Uh, I'm Celia Lee, and I am a Churchill historian. Now, it's interesting that someone has raised this issue of Richard Burton's acting. And the reason I have asked to speak is that Richard Burton told one dreadful lie about Churchill and I like, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to debunk it. He said that being as he was a Welshman, he was in sympathy with the miners during the Tony Pandy strike. And he accused Churchill of giving the army the order to fire on striking miners. Now this is a pack of lies. I'm an historian and I've researched it. Winston Churchill was at that time Home Secretary he was in charge of the police, not the army. He didn't give the order to fire, and in actual fact, no miners were fired on and no miners were killed. And it's, it's actually important that that message has got out because it's gone on in England for years, and it's amazing how many people in high places believe that Winston Churchill gave the order to fire on striking miners. Thank you. Thank you for, for bringing that up and for setting the record straight. Still, do, still doesn't excuse Mr. Burton's poor performance, but, <laughs> but there you are. Uh, David, thank you so much for inviting me here. I've had such a good time. Last night I met so many of you and had uh, wonderful discussions, and uh, uh, you, you've been very kind in welcoming me. Uh, I'm not a history major. Uh, I'm a journalist and writer and film critic, uh, but I do have a lifelong admiration for Winston Churchill, and so I'm very happy to be in your midst. Thank you for having me here.
We have um, two of Leonard's books are on sale um, in the bookseller's room down the hallway, and um, uh, Leonard will be available during the book signing session this afternoon. Happy to sign copies of those books for you. And um, I promise you, I did not tell Leonard in advance that Robert Hardy was an uh, honorary member of the International Churchill Society <laughs> and uh, a frequent presence at our conferences. And the last time he appeared at our conference, of course, was in 2015 with Celia Sands. And so he's a very beloved um, member, uh, was a very beloved member, and his memory in this organization remains beloved. Ladies and gentlemen, our next session will begin promptly at 3.30. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to begin our last session of the afternoon. Many of you were at our conference two years ago in New York City and will recall that the true highlight of that conference took place when um, Celia Sands, who's one of our honorary co-chairs this year, sat down and had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Jane Williams, who was um, the secretary for Winston Churchill. And um, Jane uh, very much wanted to be with us here this year, but uh, is no longer able to make that, that transatlantic journey. But she worked very closely with Andrew uh, in Andrew Roberts, our next speaker, when he was writing his book, Walking with Destiny. And uh, she's very prominently mentioned in the acknowledgments. And so what she's done is she has written a, a letter and asked me to read it out to you by way of introducing Andrew Roberts. So this is her letter. It is with the deepest sadness that I find it is not possible for me to be once again with the International Churchill Society at your annual gathering. Each year brings more understanding and appreciation of the extraordinary triumphs and tragedies in the life of Winston Churchill. Over 1,000 books have been written about him. Churchill will forever live in our hearts and minds. When last year I read Andrew Roberts' great biography, Churchill Walking with Destiny, I was overwhelmed with emotion, with amazement at the sheer volume and understanding of the human being that is Winston Churchill and which Andrew has brought before us. I got in touch with my friend David Freeman, who amongst other duties is the editor of Finest Hour, and told him that I believe I considered Andrew Roberts Walking with Destiny is the finest biography and account of the life of Winston Churchill I had ever read. I worked from 1949, <laughs> I worked from 1949 through 1955 as one of Churchill's secretaries. This period covered his writing of his war memoirs as well as becoming a peacetime prime minister from 1951 to 1955. So much covered in Andrew's vivid prose describes events that are familiar to me. The visits to President Eisenhower, the painting in beautiful places throughout the world, but throughout constant, concentrated, meticulous work. Everything in that great mind was spoken out loud for the secretaries to inscribe in shorthand. He drove us and rarely gave us praise, but he had subtle ways of showing his approval and we would not have had it otherwise. I would like to draw attention in Andrew's great work to a couple of descriptions that touched me particularly. On page 57, it is a des description in September 1898 of the charge of the 21st Lancers at the ba Battle of Omdurman. Churchill wrote to his mother, quote, I never felt the slightest nervousness and felt as cool as I do now. The importance of staying calm and retaining high morale in the face of heavy odds was to remain with Churchill until the end of his life. Please also read carefully the description of Churchill's period as Home Secretary, 1910 and 1911, where I noticed his capacity for affection, particularly towards his family and his loyalty to those whom he had known long and who had served him well. This magnanimity is legendary and he hated vindictiveness above all things. He would say to us, I cannot stand a witch hunt. Patience, however, was a virtue with which he was totally unfamiliar. <laughs> His temper was like lightning, but the sun never went down without a gesture that all was forgiven. There, in the end, was the smile. Walking with destiny is in no way a hagiography. Qualities and characteristics are fully, honestly, and meticulously described. The maps, the page notes, the family tree, the beautiful il illustrations all contribute to a work that can be described as a masterpiece. Thank you, Andrew. I am so grateful for this tribute, Jane Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Roberts. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, indeed, and thank you very much also for those uh, kind words, uh, David, and those kind words from Jane. Um, I don't believe what she says with regard to the family tree, um, owing to the fact that I have somebody who is in the family tree um, who died before they were born. Um, 
you get these, these, uh, these uh, kind of things uh, uh, crop up. I know all the authors in this room, of which there are so many, will appreciate that that does happen occasionally, but uh, nonetheless. I'd like to talk about the present state of Churchill's reputation um, this, e uh, this afternoon um, because it is under attack now almost as much as any other time, in fact, any other time since the 1990s. Uh, it seems to go up and down and up and down, um, and at the moment there is a, uh, a pretty sustained assault on it. And um, what one needs to do in these occasions is uh, pretty much always to go back to the original sources, to go to uh, Churchill archives, which were so um, well run by uh, Piers Brendan, who's here in the audience and is uh, and are presently wonderfully run also, of course, by Alan Packwood, and to look at the original sources and to see what genuinely Churchill uh, wrote or said, rather than, the way, than, than what the detractors are uh, pretending that uh, he wrote or said. So I'm going to go through a few, if it's all right, uh, of, I think, the most egregious of the, um, of the factually incorrect remarks that are being made about Churchill at the moment, not least so that all of you, when you come up, come up uh, at a dinner party or uh, in, in conversation with somebody who is a believer in this, um, in this uh, assault on Churchill, to have a very good line of uh, defense. The lady who's just turned up um, with uh, her daughter was the uh, American editor and publisher of uh, Walking With Destiny, and I want you all to give her a big round of applause, please. <laughs> I'd like to take you back to that wonderful um, and, uh, and emotional and also freezing cold moment on the 12th of November 1940 at Westminster Abbey when Winston Churchill was giving his eulogy to Neville Chamberlain. Uh, it was freezing cold not just because it was in November but also because they'd taken all the windows out, all the stained glass windows out of Westminster Abbey in order to uh, protect them against the Blitz and, uh, and they put up some, um, some boarding which uh, didn't uh, work with regard to the cold and so they were all in their overcoats and they were listening to this extraordinary speech, one of the greatest speeches that uh, Churchill ever gave in which he famously said history with its flickering lamp, stumbles across the trails of the past, trying to reconstruct its themes, to revive its echoes and kindle with pale gleams the passions of former days. Uh, sentences like that uh, remind us why he deserved the Nobel Prize for Literature. Yet it wasn't really a speech about history. It was a speech about the role of conscience. Chartwell, the numbers of people going to Chartwell keep going up. There's an American warship named after him. Uh, he wins those, those um, BBC polls uh, about who is the greatest Britain. Um, I think sometimes to the slight irritation of the BBC, by the way. Um, uh, what um, he uh, himself called the grievous inquest um, of, uh, of history has sat, and he has been found not guilty. However, because all history is, in a sense... Um, growing, upon, uh, uh, growing upon what has been written before. Um, it's important that we've moved now from the hagiography, frankly, some very hagiographical accounts in the 1950s through to the 1970s when there was a new vicious tone that, um, that came about with regard to history of Churchill. And then it got a bit better, and now it's, uh, it's gone um, crazy, in my view. But I'd like to look back on some of the things that we um, had to face. From the left came Clive Ponting, who argued that uh, Churchill probably knew about Pearl Harbor before it took place. What an appalling libel that is. The idea that Winston Churchill, who loved America, who was somebody who appreciated and, uh, and admired the United States Navy would have allowed an attack on Pearl Harbor to have taken place solely in order to try and get the Americans into the war. When 
even the intention to attack Pearl Harbor would have got the Americans into the war, I think is a, um, is a despicable remark to uh, have made. We've gone through, of course, I think now to the nth degree, the attacks uh, on him about being an alcoholic. Um, Clive Ponting uh, kept saying that he was, but uh, it strikes me that uh, we now appreciate that he was somebody who had an iron constitution for alcohol. Uh, he drank a lot of it, but he was in no way uh, dependent on it. Um, we have from the right a man, um, Robert Rako, a don called Rako, who calls him a war criminal, the stooge of Stalin, and a drug addict. Um, <coughs> they, uh, they rarely take refuge in understatement, um, these, uh, these revisionists. Then Nicholson Baker, um, a novelist, who quotes, uh, who, who tried to argue that Churchill was as bad as Hitler. And, uh, and he says, uh, and he quotes Churchill saying in 1920 about mustard gas, um, saying that it's about mustard gas, I'm strongly in favor of using poisoned gas against uncivilized tribes. But when one goes to the Churchill archives in Cambridge and reads the original there, what he actually said was, <coughs> making his eyes water by the use of lacrimotary gas. Gases can be used which would cause great inconvenience and spread a lively terror, yet would need, leave no serious permanent effect, uh, on most of those effect on most of those affected. What he was talking about, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, was tear gas, and he's writing history books. Um, he says, uh, Nicholson Baker, by the way, in his uh, book, I used, quote, I used Wikipedia during the writing of the book, um, especially to check facts. <coughs> uh, considering that uh, Wikipedia has a, um, a reason that I was expelled from school, which bears no relation to the truth at all, I hasten to point out, um, I would try to, uh, to um, uh, argue that you should never use Wikipedia, especially not to check facts. There's another point in um, Nicholson Baker's book where he quotes uh, an article by Churchill saying, in 19, talking about uh, Trotsky, in 1922, he might have made dictator of Russia, but for one fatal obstacle. He was a Jew. He was still a Jew. Uh, nothing could ever get over that, such intolerance, um, he, uh, he writes. When you read the rest of the uh, piece, and it implies that Churchill was being anti-Semitic, when you read the rest of the piece, he, he went on and said, such intolerance, such pettiness, such bigotry were indeed hard to bear. Now, Baker must have seen those following lines. In order to have quoted from the original ones, he must, his eyes must have continued on into the following sentence, which completely undermine the point that he was trying to make about Churchill being an anti-Semite. So it's fundamentally intellectually dishonest not to take into account the, uh, the following uh, lines. We have attacks from um, over the internet uh, that uh, Churchill was responsible for the sinking of the Lusitania, um, that um, uh, he had a secret peace treaty um, with Mussolini that um, somehow ended up in the, at the bottom of Lake Como, um, this was one that we had on the internet, uh, which um, uh, with, but it was in a sealed container at the bottom of Lake Como. So if any of you are interested in, in deep sea diving, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please go down, try and find the secret peace treaty with, uh, with Mussolini, which otherwise doesn't seem to have uh, survived in any of the archives, understandably, because it never existed. Um, editors, of course, will always, always go for stories about Churchill. We've had Churchill the flasher because uh, he, uh, he, he, he didn't um, protect himself when FDR came into the bathroom, um, even though actually we do know that he did. But part of the story is that he did cover himself with his towel before he made that very funny remark. Um, we have had fascinating um, uh, stories about the extent to which he knew or didn't know about Pamela Harriman's affair with... Uh, uh, with Avril Harriman, Pamela then Churchill uh, affair, um, which is something that, uh, unfortunately, I'd like to have got to the bottom of this. I'm sure other historians would have, but it's just simply not the kind of thing 
that um, people would have written about in, in, in those days, whether or not it was true. Um, my favorite headline was the one in The Guardian, um, Churchill was a non-smoker. Um, <coughs> Uh, sometimes, of course, these, these things do come out, uh, th th and, and they're correct. But the one about Churchill being a druid is uh, obviously something that uh, we all enjoy. But then there are books, entire books. There was one written um, a few years back which tried to argue that Winston Churchill allowed Martin Borman to escape from the uh, ruins of, um, of Berlin in April 1945. And the man who, uh, who wrote it, uh, this book, called Operation JB, and JB was named James Bond, so something tells me that it was unlikely to have been true, but he put up a quarter of a million pounds, the, this, uh, this uh, writer, to anyone who could prove that it was untrue that Winston Churchill put Martin Borman up in a, um, in a house in the home counties in England in order to debrief him uh, after the end of the Second World War. And when Martin Borman's skeleton was found um, and DNA'd successfully in Berlin, <laughs> um, this, um, uh, this, this man changed the view of whether or not he was going to, uh, he'd actually ever genuinely promised a quarter of a million pounds. We've had Margaret Cook, the, um, the wife, uh, the widow of um, Robin Cook, the former foreign secretary, saying that Winston Churchill was, quote, almost homosexual, unquote. Um, Churchill was entirely tolerant of homosexuality. He had many, many gay friends. He had people who he knew were gay at a time when you could be arrested and imprisoned for this. Uh, and it, it made no effect on him, uh, it seems, whatsoever. But the idea of trying to make him out posthumously himself to have been whatever almost homosexual means um, strikes me as completely um, absurd. There are legitimate issues, many legitimate issues on which one can be critical of Winston Churchill. Of course there are. He himself um, uh, used to make jokes about what a bad uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer he'd been. Uh, he was the first in many cases to admit that he'd made mistakes and blunders in his life. Uh, indeed, as he wrote, of course, famously from the trenches to Clementine, um, his wife, I should have made nothing if I had not made mistakes. Uh, so when people uh, debate the Sydney Street siege and his actions during that, or the Dardanelles, uh, or um, his uh, opposition to women's suffrage, for example, um, these are perfectly acceptable um, ways to attack uh, Winston Churchill. Not, however, with regard to the suffragettes. As a lady uh, in uh, the Jaipur Literary Festival two years ago, uh, told me that Winston Churchill had given an order to the police um, to, um, uh, to, I'm trying to tell, we've got a young lady, a very young lady present here, but to essentially molest uh, the suffragettes. This, there's, so, of course, needless to say, I was sitting next to this, uh, this Indian uh, academic, and I said, oh, that's fascinating. Gosh, how interesting. I've been working on Churchill for some time now, and I'd really like to see that, uh, the evidence that you have for that. And she said, I intuited it. <laughs> um, you can attack uh, Winston Churchill over the Irish partition, uh, over the gold standard, which he himself, of course, uh, criticized himself later on, over the general strike. Um, Tony Pandy and uh, Hlanetli. I don't think very many people would go so far as John MacDonald um, did. John MacDonald, sorry, the, uh, the shadow chancellor of the Exchequer and uh, the number two man to Jeremy Corbyn um, the, uh, earlier this year. And when asked whether or not uh, Churchill was a hero or a villain, he immediately said villain. Um, it says a lot, by the way, about the, uh, about the modern Labour Party that you can have the number two person just immediately say that Winston Churchill was a villain um, on the basis, as I say, of, uh, of industrial relations issues in South Wales in 1911 and to ignore all the other things that um, make it clear that he was the exact opposite of a villain. You can criticize him over the uh, abdication crisis and Indian self-government um, over the Norway campaign and uh, uh, not 
publicizing the Katyn massacre. But in each of these things, it's vital again to go back to the original sources. Very often, of course, Martin Gilbert's uh, companion volumes, which are now being heroically um, uh, finished off by Hillsdale College, and to, and to look at the context and to look at the, um, at the truth of these things rather than the, um, the revisionists' um, accounts of them. There are perfectly understandable wartime reasons why uh, Churchill and the Foreign Office did not admit that they knew who was really responsible for the Katyn massacre, namely, of course, Joseph Stalin, um, rather and, and continue to pretend that it was um, the Nazis. At the time, in the uh, Second World War, for every five Germans killed in combat uh, on the battlefield, four were killed on the Eastern Front. Um, it was uh, raison d'etat, real politique, that uh, meant that he had to say what he said over the Katyn massacre. Other um, lines of assault could be Singapore, the fall of Singapore, the air cover for HMS Repulse and the Prince of Wales, uh, Russian convoys. Uh, the, the whole Mediterranean strategy has been attacked by no less a uh, great military um, historian than uh, Professor Sir Michael Howard, who um, once interviewed General uh, Sanger and Etlin, the, uh, the German commander at Monte Cassino. And, uh, and at the end of their long uh, discussion over this, uh, the, uh, the German general said, next time you invade Italy, don't start at the bottom. <laughs> um, the issue of unconditional surrender is obviously something that, uh, that is, it's worthwhile uh, discussing, whether or not Churchill was bounced into it by, um, by FDR at the Casablanca conference. Um, the bombing of Dresden, of course, perfectly um, acceptable to discuss whether or not that was, um, that was a, a step too far. Churchillians will argue, uh, and in my view they'd be right to argue, that it was, um, it was demanded by the Soviets, that there were railway marshalling yards that uh, needed to be hit to prevent the uh, Germans from moving troops from one side of the operational theater to the other, and other aspects, the very high death rate that came as a result of the Gauleiter not pro providing uh, proper shelters. But nonetheless, it's okay to have a discussion over this. I think, personally, Churchill uh, can be defended on almost every single one that I've mentioned, and there are more. But what is not acceptable, it strikes me, is the cheating that you get again and again and the way in which people try to attack Churchill using very modern, often politically correct um, attitudes, especially, of course, towards race, that simply wouldn't have meant anything at the time and certainly, um, and certainly not uh, to him. The Bengal famine is a disgraceful and completely, in my view, unacceptable way to attack Winston Churchill. Dr. Mukherjee and, uh, of course, uh, um, the uh, uh, Indian uh, nationalist, Hindu nationalist bigot, uh, Shashi Tharoor, have accused Winston Churchill of deliberately engineering the deaths of millions of um, Bengalis. And, we, uh, and the number that they come up with is, of course, six million, not because there is any historical background to the idea of there being genuinely six million. It's just that the echo of the phrase six million, of course, uh, has such powerful Holocaust uh, connections as to be um, a line that they love to take in order to try to equate Winston Churchill with Adolf Hitler. But look at what genuinely happened. Of course, I go into this in my book for six or seven pages, and you can uh, check it out there as far as the details are concerned. But overall, the big picture is that in October 1942, a huge <coughs> cyclone hit Bengal. And as well as wiping out the rice crop on which the um, local residents uh, had lived for generations, it also destroyed the, the road and rail communications, um, which would have been used in order to have brought in food into that uh, area. 
and also at the time places that we had in the past when these uh, when these um, horrific acts of God took place we would be able to buy in food from places like Malaya and Thailand and Burma that was completely un uh, impossible when the Japanese were in occupation of all three of those countries they had the Japanese fleet had bombed eastern uh, shelled eastern Indian cities they had um, submarines in the Bay of Bengal. The idea that um, Winston Churchill was responsible uh, for, uh, for the deaths that took place, the horrific deaths that took place, yes, mistakes were made, and they were made by uh, Calcutta, and they were made by the uh, local provincial councils, which, by the way, at that stage were um, run by Muslim and uh, Hindu local native majorities. The idea that Churchill simply because he made what um, uh, today to modern ears are unacceptable um, jokes, uh, racially based jokes. The idea that because of that he actually wanted millions of people to die is a completely unacceptable, in my view, uh, twisting of the genuine historical truth. We can uh, argue about um, the bombing of Auschwitz and why it, uh, it didn't happen. There were, in this actually it strikes me that it's an it's a indication of uh, the, not just bomb, bombing Auschwitz itself but also bombing the railway lines to and from Auschwitz, a huge indication um, that, uh, that Winston Churchill was not a dictator in Britain. He's been accused of being one, uh, uh, being one but were he won, he would have insisted on the RAF bombing these railway lines. It's notoriously difficult to bomb a railway line, in fact. Uh, and, of course, it also required the RAF or the USAAF or both to cross hundreds of miles into Poland to do this. Um, but nonetheless, he uh, said, invoke me if necessary to Anthony Eden. And uh, it was stopped at several layers below him not least by John McCloy and, uh, and others in the, uh, in the uh, American authorities. But were he a genuine dictator, as he's accused of being, he would have bombed those, uh, those railway lines. Yalta, any number of, um, of lines of uh, attack on, um, on him at Yalta. Frankly, if you're an MP like Winston Churchill for two-thirds of a century, at the height of politics, for two-thirds of a century, of, and, and also, of course, somebody like him who never shied away from any issue either, of course you're going to be able to be um, attacked for, for various things. You cross the floor of the house not once but, uh, but twice. And there are certain lines of attack, I think, um, that come back again and again. There's the Tory nationalist, the extreme nationalist uh, line that was um, uh, pervaded by the late Alan Clark and the late Maurice Cowling, in which he was attacked for not accepting Adolf Hitler's peace offer in May 1940, in, uh, sorry, the May and the summer of 1940, um, because it led to socialism and it led to the loss of the empire. Apparently, it led to our great power uh, status going. But actually, if you look at what would have happened had, um, had Churchill not been there, if uh, Lord Halifax, as, uh, who was then Foreign Secretary, but of course later became Prime Minister, uh, could have become Prime Minister instead of Churchill, had he accepted that uh, peace offer, in every possible um, permutation or communication of the future, uh, we would have been in a wildly worse uh, situation. This is a man who ripped up Every Adolf Hitler, a man who ripped up every treaty that he ever signed. The idea of keeping on the empire is, a, is an absurdity as well. After 1935, it was going. It was, it was moving, at least the uh, important part of it, India, was moving towards self-government. What it would have meant with regard to demoralization here in the United States, uh, w sorry, demoralization in Britain, but also the lack of support in the United States at the time of Lend-Lease, if, uh, if we'd done some kind of ignoble deal with uh, uh, Germany, there was simply no way that the United States would have continued in its, uh, in its uh, support and affection for the, um, for the British. So again and again, I think, um, one can just argue these, these points through on straightforward intellectual lines 
Uh, and again and again, Winston Churchill actually comes out extraordinarily well from the, um, from the intellectual exercise. Um, we've seen in the last 12 months um, a, a, a series of attacks. Nigel Hamilton uh, has brought out a, uh, a book about FDR which claims that Winston Churchill was always opposed to D-Day. Um, and uh, that is simply not the case, ladies and gentlemen. From June 1940, from the time of Dunkirk, he was, trying to, he was planning to return to the continent one way or another. It doesn't mean that he wanted to do it as early as General Marshall in the fall of 1942, but it was always in the back of his mind. He wouldn't have uh, put so much um, uh, capital behind the Mulberry Harbors and the pipeline under the ocean and the various inventions and the, uh, and the landing crafts and the tank and so on and so forth, the various tank um, alterations, unless he had seen one day there would be a return. But he wasn't going to do that, ladies and gentlemen, before there was um, two things that had been done. The first, of course, was... Uh, victory um, in the air war over, over northwest France. On the day of D-Day itself, when the Luftwaffe, um, the Luftwaffe flew 3,000, sorry, 318 um, missions, 318 over the beaches of Dunkirk, the Allies flew 13,688. That is the level of, um, of air superiority that was necessary for that operation. And of course also, they needed to have won the Battle of the Atlantic. And that wasn't won until the late summer of 1943. In January 1942, the Germans added a fourth rotor to the um, Enigma machine, plunging all of the decrypts into gobbledygook. And it wasn't until the December of that year that the boffins at Bletchley Park were able to break back into the Shark Code, German naval codes, and to uh, work out, therefore, whereabouts the wolf packs, the U-boats, were meeting. So, uh, so we were able to send uh, bombers and destroyers there. If it had happened any earlier than that, there was a serious danger that the Germans would have been able to have counterattacked, uh, and a successful German counterattack against D-Day, against the Normandy operation, uh, could have set back the whole war um, a year or so. And can you imagine the, um, the, the welter of blood that would have happened as a result of that? My, uh, my old Don at Cambridge, Norman Stone, told me that uh, nothing is inevitable in history. No historian should ever use the word inevitable. It's, uh, it's the one word you should never use, because nothing is inevitable in history except for German counterattack. <laughs> um, and, uh, and you only have to look at Caen, and you look at, um, at uh, Salerno, and Anzio, and the great, um, and of course the, uh, uh, the Battle of the Bulge in, in December 1944, 39 divisional attack marching through the snow um, with sending searchlights up on the uh, clouds so that they could turn uh, night into day to um, all the messages sent by motorbikes so that none of, our, um, none of our radio decryptors were able to hear any of the plans for this. You think that they were capable of doing that in December 1944. Imagine what would have happened in the autumn of uh, 1942 or in 1943. So it is simply untrue, this latest assault on uh, Churchill's reputation by, by Nigel Hamilton and others. Um, uh, and then, of course, we had, the um, in the last year, um, Richard Toy and uh, Warren Doctor claiming that um, Winston Churchill was uh, unfaithful to Clementine uh, with, uh, with um, Lady Castle Ross, uh, but based on a fascinating and, and, and it's, it's great to listen to uh, interview of uh, Jock Colville with um, um, with um, Jock um, with uh, Bill Barnett. Thank you, thank you, uh, Piers, with Bill Barnett. Yes, my favourite bit of the of the tape, um, and I must admit, when I when I heard it the first time, I, I did sit up uh, straight to uh, listen to this. My favourite bit of the tape. Um, Actually, there are lots of funny parts of the tape, but actually, it's when you look more closely again into the um, into the actual uh, um, evidence 
that you see again and again how completely absurd and wrong and ridiculous this is. And it's not just because uh, Winston Churchill uh, fell in love with Clementine on the day he met her um, for the second time in, uh, in uh, 1908 and stayed desperately in love with her for the whole of the rest of his life. It was, it's actually a letter in which Lady Castle Ross, after supposedly a four-year affair with uh, Churchill, writes him a note and gives um, him her telephone number, which is a four-digit code. And it strikes me, if you've had an affair with a woman for four years, you're going to remember her four-digit telephone number. Um, there are other, um, there are other uh, uh, circumstantial pieces of, uh, of evidence to suggest that this is complete rubbish. And just yet another of these, uh, of these attacks on Winston Churchill that, um, that sensible people and people who are interested in the evidence and actually going and finding out the truth uh, simply will not, um, will not believe. So I'm going to end with um, the rest of the, uh, the paragraph, the, the peroration indeed, of uh, Churchill's speech on that freezing cold winter, uh, winter day in um, November 1940 when he was uh, speaking about Neville Chamberlain's reputation, of course, but also, I think, as so often with Winston Churchill when he was giving eulogies, he was, uh, he was also slightly referring to himself. And he said, what is the worth of all this? The only guide to a man is his conscience. The only shield to his memory is the rectitude and sincerity of his actions. It's very imprudent to walk through life without this shield because we are so often mocked by the failure of our hopes and the upsetting of our calculations. But with this shield... However the fates may play, we always march in the ranks of honor. Ladies and gentlemen, Winston Churchill, he, he marches there still. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so we have, uh, so we have some time for some questions, if anybody would like to uh, go into. Gentlemen, uh, gentlemen there. Uh, there's a uh, microphone that's that's being sprinting towards you. Thank you. Uh, is there a corollary possibly between January of 42 and the possibility of America and Great Britain uh, forming an alliance after Brexit? <laughs> right. Sorry. I thought this was going to be a good question about Churchill's reputation. And... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, well, I so hope so, as you can imagine. It would be magnificent. If, uh, if we were to have a, uh, a, a really comprehensive uh, trade deal with the United States, a free trade deal of some uh, really generous and, and understanding and, and large kind, a settlement um, financially that would uh, be able to help us get over um, the uh, inevitable dislocations that we're going to have uh, post-Brexit, then, uh, then wonderful. And uh, if you're asking me to equate um, Donald Trump and FDR or, or Boris and Winston Churchill, I'm not quite ready to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, having said that, I am very, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that uh, we have, as Prime Minister, somebody who's written a book about Winston Churchill, who's interested in him, who, um, and has learned a few of the lessons, not least that of audacity. <laughs> Next question. Thank you. As part of the, the Churchill youth movement here, um, I know that a lot of uh, modern day uh, scholars will throw charges at Churchill and also another uh, great figure you've profiled, Napoleon, for their imperial ambitions. So imperialism, as you're well aware, has fallen on very hard times. I'd be interested in hearing uh, how you would handle that particular challenge to both Churchill, Napoleon's more complicated perhaps, but uh, along imperial lines. Thank you. Yes, that's a very good question, and you're right. It does, it does come up uh, an awful lot. Um, actually, not hugely in this country, but, uh, but in England an awful lot, and, uh, and especially at universities, wherever I, I speak at universities. Uh, colonialism and imperialism and Churchill's support for those uh, concepts are, um, uh, are very much held against him. And what I like to uh, remind my listeners on these occasions is that 
Winston Churchill was actually alive whilst Charles Darwin was alive, when it was considered, uh, generally considered, um, that there was a hierarchy of the races, something which we uh, consider to be um, today know to be absurd and, uh, and obscene. But at the time, it was considered to be scientific fact. And, um, and therefore, I don't think that um, Winston Churchill should be singled out in any way for having, um, for having considered that imperialism was a worthwhile thing because you have to appreciate that his form of imperialism was entirely different from the neo-Darwinists, from people, well, certainly like the Nazis, because his assumption was that if, he, if uh, the British race was on a higher plane uh, in so many ways from the native peoples of the empire, it was an absolute moral duty to do everything in order to help improve the lives uh, of the native peoples. That is precisely 100% different from the assumption of the neo-Darwinists and, uh, and the Nazis um, that actually that gave you carte blanche to treat everybody else as slaves. And so there is a massive moral difference and one that I never find terribly difficult to explain to people. Um, and uh, it's wonderful that you are doing something to tell, um, to tell the future generations about Winston Churchill. And that would be the line to take uh, if, I were, if I were you, because it's not, intelligent people can always understand it. The only people who don't want to understand it are the people who, for ideological or political reasons, um, will not understand it. Sir? Here's your, um, here's your microphone. I'm, I'm very impressed with your. Yes, it is. Oh, I, I'm very impressed with your um, presentation today, and also with your book that I own, Thank and you. it's very helpful. But you've said something that's really caught my attention. You're talking about uh, he was not a dictator. Um, had he been, he probably would have bombed the um, railway lines and everything to the death camps. Well. Um, I've never understood why they did nothing about the death camps, but um, how was Britain operating? Who would have made the decision uh, to not bomb those camps? Well, it was a joint decision, um, of course, because it was the um, United States Air Force that uh, would have done this uh, as well. And, um, and this has been looked into, as you can imagine, in, in enormous detail. The people at whose desks it seems to just sort of slip away are John McCloy and Anthony Eden. Um, and uh, of course they didn't know precisely what was going on. Um, the, uh, the photographs that we see when you visit Auschwitz and you see the selection ramps, um, th that photograph was not actually uh, developed in, during the Second World War. It was developed uh, almost immediately after the Second World War. It's one of those uh, horrific moments where if only they had developed it a year earlier, um, they would have had a far better idea. And you see everything, including uh, smoke coming out from one of the crematoria uh, chimneys. Um, but that was not um, discovered until, uh, until after the war. That you did have, of course, some incredibly brave people, including Poles, um, Jan Korski and others, who, um, who, who came back and told people. Uh, there were some photographs, um, but there wasn't enough for McCloy and uh, Eden to, um, uh, to send the bombers halfway across Europe. And... Um, uh, and bomb railway lines, which, as I mentioned earlier, are, um, are very difficult to um, to hit. I was once, <laughs> I want Margaret Thatcher once uh, explained to me why a railway line is difficult to hit, uh, which is a wonderful um, person to tell you about that kind of thing. Um, the, re the reason is that if, according to Margaret, I, I haven't double checked with anybody else, um, that if the first bomb doesn't um, doesn't align with the railway line, all the others are going to go off and uh, not hit it. So you basically have to go along the railway line or crisscross it in the hope that it's going to hit. Um, very difficult thing to do. Is that a lot? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, let me give you a briefing for what's going to happen next and what's going to happen this evening. First of all, um, those people who are going to be attending the Board of Academic Advisors for the Churchill Society, that meeting will now take place in the DuPont Ballroom at 4.30. Academic Advisors meeting in the DuPont Ballroom at 4.30. The book signing will begin immediately um, downstairs. Now this is counterintuitive because a bookseller's room is still on this level down at the end of the hall, but the authors will be signing their books downstairs on the main level in the Georgetown room, which is um, next to the hotel restaurant. That will be from 4.15 to 5.15. The booksellers will be closing at 5 o'clock. And let me remind you, this is your last chance to buy a copy of Admiral Stavridis's book if you would like to try to get him to sign it this evening when he is our keynote speaker. Uh, with respect to this evening, the reception will begin at 6.30. That's going to take place immediately outside this room in the uh, foyer from 6.30 to 7.30. Dinner will be in this room. We'll have it flipped over and set up for dinner to start at 7.45. And the e program for this evening will begin at 8.45. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.